several events elaborating on the facts of the persecution of Falun Gong in China took place concurrently with the Ministerial to Advance Religious Freedom in Poland. The Chinese Communist Party's war on faith targets Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, and Falun Gong devotees alike. The party spares no one. Swedish Member of Parliament Anne Sophie Elm said that the Chinese Communist Party has persecuted Falun Gong for 21 years. What is surprising is that the persecution is still going on. How it can still be ongoing? It's not only disgraceful to the CCP, it is shameful for the whole free world as I see it. A webinar with China Tribunal focused on the forced organ harvesting of Falun Gong practitioners in China. London-based lawyer and counsel to tribunal, Hamid Sabi, summarized its conclusion. The, the tribunal concluded that since 99, to 1999, there has been a consistent use of Falun Gong members as donors or forced organ harvesting donors of the organs, and these have been used by China for its purposes and probably for profit. China Tribunal Chair Sir Jeffrey Nice QC broke down the evidence and acknowledged that the tribunal was aware of the general opinion of the PRC being a severe human rights violator and therefore deliberately addressed such a potential prejudice. How do we set aside, if, if we have prejudged opinions about the People's Republic of China being a human rights violation? And we did have those opinions. It would be impossible not to have them. And it would be dishonest to say we didn't have them. We acknowledged straight away, yes, we had read a great, we, we had read nothing, any of us actually, about forced organ harvesting or the Falun Gong, we were complete newcomers to that. But of course, we'd all read about the People's Republic of China being a massive human rights offender. So we set it up right at the beginning. Yes, we, we, we recognize that. How are you going to set it aside? Well, what we did was the following. We took the evidence and we broke it up and it was evidence that could conveniently be broken up because it came in different categories. Let me just give you two categories, I suppose. One category is of um, uh, people in custody, Falun Gong and others, but people in custody and their treatment. Well, treatment was torture and all sorts of other things. But the Falun Gong in particular, and almost no one else, were really tested for by blood samples and by other methods in ways that were consistent with checking on the state of their organs, nothing else. And by the way, of course, the Falun Gong, peaceful people, don't smoke, don't drink, pretty healthy, good organs. And so we took that evidence, just the evidence of the medical testing, and we said, okay, got this evidence. Now let's say, what would that evidence tell us if it related not to the People's Republic of China, but to say New Zealand or the Republic of um, Ireland, countries which both have very good human rights records? What would it tell us just on its own? And so we reached a little decision we then turn to the next category of evidence. We did the same thing. So another category of evidence would be uh, evidence of phone calls. Phone calls have been made uh, by uh, pe people very concerned about these practices for a decade and more, hundreds, thousands of them, to hospitals and medical practitioners in the People's Republic of China. It's been over there. So somebody rings up and says, you know, I'd like a a liver because my relation, my, my spouse, my auntie, my mother, my father is in need of a liver. And can you provide one? So the answer would come back, yes. And when? Well, next week. 
And if you keep getting that evidence um, and, and the phone calls provided that evidence on a massive scale, you're able to draw, and about other organs as well, kidneys and so on and so forth, you're able to draw conclusions, not in respect to the People's Republic of China, but in respect of such evidence applied to another imaginary country, or if you find it easier, a country you know to be a country of good repute. Then you have a series of small, always very conservative decisions. You add them together, and out comes the result. Sir Nice also said the tribunal repeatedly invited the PRC to either add counter evidence or attend the hearings, but it never did. Mr. Sabi mentioned at the end of the day, people are affected by such moral issues. Both Jeffrey and I are here because we believe that sitting back and doing nothing is not the answer. There are always reasons not to do anything. You can always say, okay, the government of Iran takes no notice of the pressures from outside China, the same. And all these countries are the same, but it's not, it's not true. At the end of the day, these governments, no matter how brutal they are, they are composed of people. These people have children, they have families, they have friends. They get affected by these moral issues, whether they want or not. And they travel abroad, their children travel abroad. They hear about these things. So I don't think sitting silent is an answer because then Otherwise, we are all wasting our time. We have to do what we can. And being a human rights activist doesn't pay. It takes a long, long time until you see a little or sometimes no effect of what you have done and spend your time on. But at the end of the day, perhaps that's the only thing that, that would change the world. If you don't try, you will fail. If you do try, you may succeed. <laughs>